Welcome to this new module, Medical Emergencies. It will cover all types of medical emergencies. After completing this module, you should be able to define terms related to medical emergencies, explain the purpose of an emergency cart and its contents, describe the signs and symptoms and procedures for handling various medical emergencies, and finally demonstrate appropriate principles of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We will now review radiology emergencies that can include any of the following. Shock, pulmonary embolism, diabetes, head injuries, respiratory distress, cerebral vascular accident or CVA, and cardiac arrest. Shock is a failure of the circulatory system to support vital bodily functions. There are three stages, compensatory stage, progressive stage, and irreversible stage. In the compensatory stage, blood moves from the lungs, skin, kidney, and GI tract to the brain and the heart. The skin becomes cold and clammy. There is decreased urine output with increased respiration and hypoactive bowel sounds. At this point, the blood pressure is normal, but the patient will experience increased anxiety. The next stage is the progressive stage. The blood pressure falls because the heart's pumping is inadequate and capillaries begin leaking fluid, which decreases fluid in circulation. The renal, GI, and hematologic system, which includes the spleen, bone marrow, and liver, begin to fail. At this point, the respiration rate is rapid and shallow. There may be pulmonary edema, fluid leaking from the pulmonary capillaries, tachycardia, chest pain, and a change in mental status. The patient may experience confusion, lethargy, or may lose consciousness. There continues to be renal, hepatic, GI, and hematologic procedures and problems. There continues to be renal, hepatic, GI, and hematologic problems. The patient needs immediate treatment to prevent death. In the irreversible stage, the blood pressure continues to fall and heart pumping is now totally inadequate with capillaries leaking fluid, which decreases fluids in the circulation. The renal, GI, and hematologic systems, which include the spleen, bone marrow, and liver, are in an irreversible state of failure. There is a buildup of lactate in the blood and the liver is unable to remove excess acid, resulting in lactic acidosis. At this stage, treatment options are limited. The four basic types of shock are hypovolemic shock caused by a loss of blood or tissue fluids from a trauma, for example, cardiogenic shock when the heart is unable to pump adequate volume of blood 
to tissues due to a cardiac disorder, including a heart attack. Neurogenic shock, which is due to spinal anesthesia or damage to the upper spinal cord. And finally, vasogenic shock, which can be due to sepsis, deep anesthesia, or anaphylaxis, and which is allergy induced. Vasogenic shock causes massive dilation of blood vessels and increases arterial blood pressure. There are three types of vasogenic shock. Anaphylactic shock, which is caused by a severe allergic reaction. Septic shock, associated with bacteria in the bloodstream and can cause inadequate supply of blood to the body's tissue. And deep anesthesia shock, which is associated with surgery. Anaphylactic shock is a form of vasogenic shock and it is the most common shock caused by radiologic procedures. It can range from mild to severe. Mild reactions can include urticaria, itching, nausea, and vomiting. More severe reactions include laryngeal edema, and cardiac arrest. Vasogenic shock can occur after the administration of contrast media. The technologist must monitor patients after any contrast administration and look for signs and symptoms of a reaction. A physician must be alerted immediately if there are any signs of anaphylactic shock. Shock can be also categorized as distributive. In distributive shock, there is a pooling of blood in the peripheral blood vessels, resulting in a decrease venous return of blood to the heart and a decrease in blood pressure because the blood vessels cannot constrict and assist the venous return. The three types of shock can also be categorized as distributive. Anaphylactic shock caused by severe allergic reaction. Septic shock, which is associated with bacteria in the bloodstream and can cause inadequate supply of blood to body tissues and neurogenic shock as a result of a spinal cord injury or medication. Obstructive is another category of shock. Obstructive shock results from pathological conditions that interfere with the normal pumping of the heart. The heart can be free of pathologic conditions, but other factors such as pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertensive, arterial stenosis, tumors, or constricting pericarditis interferes with the pumping action of the heart. Common signs of shock include restlessness, anxiety, weakness, weak and rapid or thready pulse, cold, clammy, moist skin with profuse sweating. The patient may initially have a dull, chalk-like skin appearance, regardless of their color, followed by a bluish or cyanotic coloration of the skin. Breathing is often shallow and irregular or labored, rapid or gasping. 
The patient may experience disorientation often with closed or partially closed eyelids, dull, lusterless eyes, or dilated pupils. Some patients experience extreme thirst or may have nausea and or vomiting. Generally, there is a gradual or steadily drop in blood pressure to about 90 over 60 or lower, and eventually the blood pressure is unobtainable. If the patient develops sudden shock, there is a possible of fainting, shaking, and trembling of the arms and legs as if chilled. Some patients become anxious because of the feeling of an impending doom. Preventing shock is the goal of the technologist. Some suggestions when imaging an emergency patient are to, number one, keep the patient's temperature normal. Sponge the patient if he or she is feverish, but do not overdo it. Avoid intense cooling, which causes shivering. Put blankets underneath and over the patient if he or she is cool. Prevent loss of heat, but do not add more heat. It is better to, for the patient to be slightly cool than to be too warm. Number two, ensure adequate breathing. This may involve merely observing the patient's breathing or positioning the patient to ensure adequate drainage of any fluid obstructing the airways. Number three, stop bleeding if it is present. Use direct and firm pressure with sterile gauze com compresses and then bandages over the site of bleeding from arteries or oozing from veins. Elevate the part or apply a tourniquet as needed. Maintain a head low position except when contraindicated. Use the position that is most comfortable for the patient and that will not make the injury worse. Number four, immobilize fractures. This will reduce damage to the soft tissues and splintered bone ends. And it may help further hemorrhage and pain. Immobilizing fractures also makes the patient more comfortable and increases the safety of transport. Number five, avoid any rough or excessive handling. Number six, image quickly but safely and use caution when transferring the patient. Number seven, monitor the patient's state of consciousness, their pulse and blood pressure. If possible, record the patient's vitals every few minutes until the patient leaves your care. And finally, number eight, do not give the patient any food or liquids. Give nothing, not even medication, orally. If your patient goes into shock, you must immediately stop the procedure. Place the patient supine with feet elevated and ensure maintenance of the patient's body temperature. Notify a physician or call a code. Continue to check the patient's breathing and be prepared to assist an emergency. When the emergency medical personnel arrive, 
assist by recording vital signs while waiting for assistance. Do not leave the patient unattended. We will now cover pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary embolism is caused by an occlusion of one or more pulmonary arteries by a thrombus or thrombi. The thrombus originates in the venous circulation or right side of the heart and it is carried to the lungs. Onset is often sudden, although the patient may experience sharp pain in the extremities. Symptoms can include shortness of breath, chest pain, and cough. Some patients have excessive sweating, clammy or cyanosis skin, rapid or irregular heartbeat, fever, or pain in the lower extremities. A pulmonary embolism needs immediate treatment. The technologist should stop the procedure and call a physician if a pulmonary embolism is suspected. The treatment can include administration of anticoagulants, blood thinners to dissolve the blood clots. Diabetes is a metabolic disease that causes high blood sugar levels. Insulin is a hormone that is produced in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. Insulin regulates the amount of glucose in the blood and the lack of insulin or insufficient insulin causes a buildup of glucose in the blood, resulting in the condition known as diabetes. In diabetes, the patient's body is unable to adjust the insulin production and excretion, needs to meet the carbohydrate demands of the body. Patients coming to the imaging department with known cases of diabetes may be treated with an insulin shot or diabetic pills and may need to adjust his or her diet to balance insulin depending on the type of diabetes. There are three general types of diabetes, type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. Type 1 diabetes most often occurs in persons under 30 years old. In this condition, the body produces very little or no insulin. Patients with type 1 diabetics, also called juvenile in onset diabetes, takes insulin regularly. In terms of diagnostic preparation, if no food is taken, the patient should not take insulin. Type 2 diabetes most often occurs in persons over 40 years. This is caused by impaired sensitivity to insulin or a decreased production of insulin. Diabetes mellitus is often associated with overweight, medical condition, or syndromes. Gestational diabetes occurs in later months of pregnancy. In gestational diabetes, Hormones secreted by the placenta prevent the body's regulation of insulin and result in the buildup of glucose in the blood. The body's insulin production is not sufficient to handle the additional 
glucose production and the result is high blood sugar levels. Gestational diabetes is not generally an emergency in radiology. Diabetic emergency would be a result of insufficient production of insulin or inadequate utilization of insulin. This can result in hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a condition of excessive insulin resulting in low blood sugar levels. This can occur if a patient takes a normal dose of insulin and does not eat as part of the exam procedure. The patient will need a quick form of carbohydrate or can take a glucose tablet. Examples could be orange juice or sweets. After eating, the patient should sit still for 10 to 15 minutes to allow for the food to take effect. The patient cannot be given food or drink if he or she becomes unconscious. In that case, seek immediate medical assistance. The patient with hypoglycemia will be extremely hungry, weak, shaky, may sweat excessively, may be confused and irritable, and is sometimes aggressive. In hyperglycemia, there is an excess sugar in the blood due to lack of insulin. This would develop gradually and could occur if the patient is unaware of his or her diabetic condition. Symptoms can be excessive thirst and urination, dry mucosa, rapid and deep breathing, drowsiness, and confusion. Immediate insulin is required. Untreated, this will lead to a diabetic coma. This condition is less common in imaging departments. Other less common diabetic conditions include diabetic ketoacidosis. In this condition, the body has insufficient insulin as a result of the body breakdown of fat into fatty acids and glycerol. The liver converts these into ketone bodies or ketosis because there is no insulin. This results in a metabolic acidosis or an acidic blood. Diabetic ketoacidosis can be caused by missing a dose of insulin. For example, if the patient has to wait too long for a test, infection or other illness, an undiagnosed or untreated type 1 diabetes mellitus can also result in diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis is a life-threatening complication that needs immediate attention. Hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome, or coma, is the loss of effective insulin in the body, leading to diuresis and loss of fluids and electrolytes. It is caused by acute illness, infection, therapeutic procedures such as dialysis, or diagnostic procedures that require dietary change. The result is extremely high blood sugar levels.
Untreated, this may cause the patient to have seizures, coma, and can result in death. Head injuries can be the result of trauma, falls, or sporting accidents. The patient's condition should be assessed before the start of the procedure and repeatedly through the procedure. The technologist should be aware that the patient's clinical symptoms may not manifest immediately. Ask the patient to state his or her name, date, address, and the reason for coming to radiology. As you instruct the patient in positioning, note the patient's ability to follow your commands. Assess the patient's vital signs again, a baseline to note any changes. CT is the preferred imaging modality used to assess brain swelling or hematoma. Head injuries are categorized by the patient's level of consciousness. Least severe injury has the patient alert and conscious. The patient will respond fully to questions and other stimuli. Next is the drowsy patient who responds to loud speaking or gentle physical contact. The unconscious will react only to painful stimuli such as pinches or pinpricks and does not respond to verbal stimuli. The comatose patient is unresponsive to virtually all stimuli. If an alert or drowsy patient starts to show signs of irritability, lethargy, slowing pulse, and slowing respiration rates, the technologist should take note. These symptoms and any changes in the level of consciousness could be an indication of a deteriorating head injury. A careful assessment is needed because the patient could be intoxicated. However, the technologist should never assume, even with an intoxicated patient, that the patient has just passed out. If the patient's status changes, immediately stop the procedure and seek medical assistance. The technologist should stop the procedure and seek help immediately if he or she is suspect that the patient has a deteriorating head injury. The first task while waiting for help is to maintain an open airway. Try to minimize any movement of the patient and monitor the patient's vital signs while waiting for help. Respiratory distress can include asthma or choking. Asthma attacks can be triggered in asthmatic patients when they are exposed to stressful situations such as during a procedure in the radiology department. In an asthma attack, the patient is in respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is caused by dilation of bronchi or inspiration and collapse on exhalation. A patient in respiratory distress may exhibit wheezing, a result of dilation of the bronchi on inspiration, and collapse on exhalation. This can be a medical crisis. However, patients will often have an aerosol inhaler or bronchodilator. The key is to remain calm, stop the procedure, and allow the patient to relax 
and use their inhaler. Choking is due to a blocked airway due to an obstruction. The first task is to identify that choking is in progress. The patient may grab their throat with both hands as their face reddens. In a true choke, the patient is unable to speak. The universal sign of choking is clutching the throat with one or both hands. Do not attempt any treatment until choking is confirmed. The patient will not be able to speak if it is a true choking incident. Always ask the patient, can you speak? Patients with partial obstruction can verbalize their problem, but patients with complete obstruction cannot. If the patient has a partial obstruction, encourage the patient to cough. Do not begin back thumps or abdominal thrusts if it is a partial obstruction. With a true obstruction, the patients should be encouraged to cough. If coughing is not successful, the abdominal thrust maneuver should be used. The abdominal thrust or Heimlich maneuver is used on patients who are choking. The abdominal thrust will increase intrathoracic pressure sufficiently to propel the lodged object out of the throat. The process of the abdominal thrust is as follows. The rescuer stands behind the patient and wraps both arms around them. Grab one fist with the other hand and place the thumb side of the fist in the middle of the patient's abdomen, below the sternum, but above the navel. Hold arms away from the patient and exert th thrusting pressure inward and upward. Hold arms away from the patient and exert pressure inward and upward. You must exert each thrust separately. However, repeat quickly six to ten times or until the obstructing object is expelled. If the patient loses consciousness, check the pulse and begin CPR. The thrust of CPR can expel the object. Do not put your finger in the patient's mouth for a blind sweep unless the object is seen. However, check the mouth for foreign objects after one cycle, which is 30 compressions to two breaths. Give rescue breaths even if the object was not dislodged. Breaths could force the object into the lungs. The rationale is that aspiration will need surgery, but the patient will live. If the foreign object is visible in the open mouth, the rescuer should perform a finger sweep to remove the object. If the patient becomes unconscious, place them in a supine position. The rescuer then kneels astride the patient and places the heel of one hand on mid sternum. The second hand is placed directly on top of the first hand. Thrust is applied to expel the object. If the patient is pregnant, the abdominal thrust is dangerous even in the late stages of pregnancy. A chest thrust is used instead. Place the fist in the center of the sternum to apply the thrust. 
If the patient is one year old or under, use a combination of chest thrust and back blows. First, determine the location for hand placement. Apply the index finger on the sternum just below the intermammary line between the breasts. The rescuer should hold the infant along the rescuer's arm with the head lower than the trunk and supporting the infant's jaws. Apply four chest thrusts using two to three fingers only. For the back blows, support the infant on your thigh and use the heel of the hand to deliver four back blows between the infant's scapulae while continuing to support the infant's head and neck. Cerebrovascular accidents, or CVA, are commonly called a stroke or brain attack. They are more likely to occur in patients over the age of 75, but can occur at any age. A CVA may develop gradually or suddenly, but sometimes has warning signs. A CVA can be caused by occlusion of the blood supply to the brain, rupture of the blood supply to the brain, or rupture of a cerebral artery leading to hemorrhage into the brain tissue or spaces. There are three different types of strokes. The ischemic or clots are a result of an obstruction within a blood vessel. The hemorrhagic or bleed stroke is the result of a blood vessel ruptures either due to aneurysms or arteriovenous malformations, otherwise known as AVMs. The transient ischemic attack, or TIA, is a mini stroke and is the result of a temporary clot. CVA can result in neurological damage and early treatment is vital. The most commonly applied medication to treat a stroke is the intravenous injection of tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. Intravenous TPA, also called clot-busting drug, can be given only within a four to five hour window of the stroke occurring. Other medications that are used are antiplatelet or anticoagulant medicines. A cardiac arrest is the stoppage of cardiac output due to a blockage of cardiac arteries. Signs of a cardiac arrest are varied. Some common signs are crushing chest pain and pain radiating down the arm. If the patient has a cardiac arrest during the course of an x-ray procedure, the first task is to call a code. The technologist should then initiate CPR. Most automatic external defibrillators or AEDs can be applied and the defibrillator will determine if a shock is needed. The operator should first determine if the patient has a cardiac arrest. If cardiac arrest is established, turn on the defibrillator. Attach the defibrillator and initiate rhythm analysis. If indicated, the unit will deliver a shock. If no shock is indicated, CPR should be continued. It is recommended that the AED pads be kept on the patient. 
the AED will reanalyze every two minutes to determine if a shock is needed. When applying, the AED pads never overlap. If there is enough chest area to place the pads apart, do so. If there is not enough chest area to place the pads apart, such as on a small child, place one pad on the side of the body and the other to the back of the body. Never use a child AED pad on an adult. However, the adult pad can be used on a child. Thanks for watching. To purchase the full course and earn your CE credits, click on the link in the description or head on over to our website at www.medical-professionals.com. And while you're there, check out our All Access Pass, where you can get unlimited CE credits for your state and ARRT renewal for just $49.99. We also offer a host of free resources to make it easier than ever for radiologic technologists like you to achieve excellence. Check out our free radiology CE webinars, clinical reference guides, and free CE courses on our website today. Be more than just certified. Choose medical professionals.